Hello, and welcome to the Strong Writing Podcast. My name is Eivindur Karlsson, and I'm an Icelandic singer-songwriter. I want to bring songwriters together so we can help each other bring more great music into the world, making it a slightly better place, one song at a time. Um, this is the first time I'm doing this on video, so uh, let's hope uh, we all enjoy that. Uh, but of course, the audio version will be up, same as usual. My guest today is Nick Morrison, uh, an amazing guy I just came in contact with. Nick is uh, an Amazon number one best-selling author, professional musician, composer, teacher, narrator, voice actor, YouTube creator, actor, and music media consultant from Calgary, Alberta. Um, he's toured throughout the United States, Canada, and Japan as a guitarist, worked as a session musician and writer, composer for Warner Brothers, Universal Studios, Sony, MTV, ABC, NBC, HGTV, HBO, and more. It's This is an impressive resume right here, and I can't wait to get into that. So today, uh, me and Nick, we're going to talk about writing and licensing music for uh, film and TV, which is something that I'm super excited about. I've been wanting to try my hand at that for a while, and I'm I'm really anxious to learn from Nick. Now, before we start, I want to tell you about a brand new resource that you can get on the Strong Writing website, strongwriting.net. I've just put together a really powerful goal-setting workbook that you can get for free. And again, that's strongwriting.net. Now, I know many of us struggle to stay the course with our songwriting, and it's very easy to fall victim uh, to, to, you know, the whole never finding any time or feeling uninspired, and then days turn into weeks, turn into months, and we realize that we haven't written a song in ages. Well, proper goals are the best way to combat that. And I put together this great printable workbook that you can use to work your way through setting great goals and push you forward on your songwriting journey. So to get this free resource, just visit strongwriting.net slash goals right now. That's strongwriting.net slash goals. And uh, you can download it, print it out, and fill it out, and you're good to go, and you are going to have massive help in reaching your goals. And speaking of goals, one of my goals is to get into the film music game, and I'm going to take advantage of having a guest on today who knows a lot about that. Nick Morrison, welcome to my podcast. So nice Hello, to have sir. you. Hello, sir. Thank you for having me. I'm pleasure to be here. Great. So before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your story and uh, all of that stuff? Yeah. Do you want the the short version or the long version? Give us the, well, I mean, are we talking war and peace long or are we talking? <laughs> no, go I ahead. can do Give war us. and peace. I'll, I'll try to sum it up and keep it, keep it relatively uh, short so that your listeners don't fall asleep. Um, so, <laughs> so I've been a professional music. Uh, I've been a professional musician for over 20 years at this point. Um, primarily playing guitar, uh, but I dabble in a few other instruments as most musicians do. Yeah. And, uh, around, uh, 2008, 2009, I decided that I didn't really want to be playing, uh, in front of people as much anymore and being touring and, you know, um, looking for ways to expand my earning potential rather than just me on stage playing or me in studio playing. Uh, or even me in studio creating and writing, but I was looking for ways to expand my my income. And of course, the internet being what it was, the big you know topic, and I'm sure you've seen it if you watch any sort of YouTube or anything, is passive income, passive income, passive passive income, income yeah, uh, which is of course a myth. But um, of course, you know. But I was I was looking at ways to to do that, and uh, a, a friend of mine was getting starting to sort of get involved with uh writing jingles for radio stations and he said to me he says you know what you should probably do is is you know kind of what i'm doing like start calling your local radio stations and see if they would you know accept demos and maybe they can contract with you and da, 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 da. so i started doing that and um and then around that time i had found uh if you remember back in the days when there were such things as music ma magazines <laughs> you know like oh, guitar yeah. player and guitar player one uh music industry pro there were like there was a ton of them but in the back there was usually an ad about yay big and it was something like are you a singer songwriter or a band looking to get paid for your music uh join taxi today 
blah, blah, oh, blah, yeah. the world's biggest A&R agency. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Cause I was having no luck with the jingle thing. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say no luck, just not a lot of luck, a few little things here and there. And, uh, and so I looked at this taxi ad and I thought, okay, well, that would be interesting. Why not give it a shot? So I checked it out, blah, blah, blah. took the plunge and, uh, and started using that service. And for those of your listeners that maybe don't know, taxi is an independent A&R agency. Um, and what that means is basically ad agencies, businesses, uh, radio, uh, production companies, uh, marketing agencies, film companies, TV companies, like anything that needs music will contact taxi and say, Hey, we're looking for X, Y, Z. And then taxi puts out a listing, they call it to their membership and says, Hey, we're accepting demos for da, 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 da. And then you, you pitch your ideas and they've got, or you pitch your tracks and they've got a whole panel of what they call, um, uh, uh, screeners that listen through and basically do the good pile, bad pile and all the good stuff gets sent to the company and all the bad stuff is, is rejected. And, uh, and then from there, if the company likes your stuff, they'll get in touch with you directly and either, you know, pay you up front in terms of a, a, a sync fee or they'll pay you on the back end royalties or they'll do both or, you know, whatever, every, every company and every deal is a little bit different. So anyway, I started getting involved with them and I started having some success and I started making really great connections in the business. Um, a couple really good licensing agencies, um, and, and ad houses that I was working with, I was starting to get more and more work. Um, around that time I moved to Vancouver, which is at that time was still kind of Hollywood North. It went through a kind of a depression through the mid 2010s and uh, is starting to maybe to see a little bit of a resurgence now. But uh, while I was there, I was also then, uh, you know, two feet in a heartbeat going door to door, you know, to, to make connections and meet other professionals and meet marketing agencies and so on and so forth. And um, that's kind of how I got my start with, with film and TV. And uh, here we are 2022. So it's been what, 12 or 14 years later and I'm still doing it. So I must be doing something right. <laughs> but, uh, I've, I've, I've also, you know, expanded my business as well. I also do, um, and I know this is not necessarily of interest to your listeners, but I do, I do book narration, audio narration, that sort of thing, uh, production consulting and, um, uh, and education. I teach, I teach guitar young, uh, well, young and not so young guitar players, how to get better at the instrument. So that's kind of the, the, the focus of my business these days is doing that, but I still do the film and television stuff too, but I've gotten, it's nice. I've gotten to a point where I don't necessarily have to go out and try and find new business every couple of weeks, right? I've got enough res residuals coming in now that I can uh, kind of relax a little bit with with that end of the business. Passive income. Yeah. <laughs> it is not. Yeah, it's it's funny because it's, it's a myth and it's not a myth. I think it's a myth in the sense where a lot of internet marketers say, oh, passive income, passive income, you know, join my, join my program and pay me whatever, $2,000 or whatever, $500. Um, join my program and you're going to have passive income in three months. And it's like, well, it doesn't really work like that. You know, to get to that point, you have to, you have to build a business and some businesses it's six, six to 18 months. Others, it's five to 10 years before you have an actual passive income stream coming in from, you know, creative work. But ultimately, yeah, as creators, we can get there. It's to me, it's, it's not about like sitting back and not working. It's about not getting paid for showing up somewhere and staying there for hours. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's really the, you know, it's it, the goal. Yeah. That's the goal of, you know, totally not, not being, not, you know, being a gigging musician. Yeah. Which is also fun. Um, yeah. of course, COVID notwithstanding, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really gigged, uh, in the past yeah. almost three years, but yeah, <laughs> but it's nice too. Cause like you said, it's like, you know, I used to, I had two rules when I was, when I was playing, like when I was doing session work and, and, and touring support, it was basically, um, as long as I don't get hurt physically, mm -hmm. um, and as long as it doesn't embarrass me or my family in some way, mm -hmm. I say yes to every opportunity as yeah. long as it fit in my schedule, you know, um, which was good and bad. It meant I made, I made money and I could eat and I could have a career, but yeah. it also meant that I ended up playing a lot of shows and a lot of bands and a lot of, um, sessions where I was like, man, I wish I wasn't doing this right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and now, you know, I have that ability. If something comes in, I can, I can look at it and say, wow, thank you so much for the offer. I'm touched that you thought of me, but I'm, you know, I'm just too busy right now. I can't, I can't take that project on, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it, it, to me, you know, obviously, um, those who know me know that I 
do uh, a lot, of, probably most of my professional work these days in theater. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's, you know, I write songs and music for, for theater productions. Nice. And so, uh, you know, when I connected with you, uh, it, it was actually uh, kind of like, yeah, it was, it was very uh, fortunate because it's, you know, getting into film and TV is something that I've been interested in pursuing for a, a long time. And so, nice. you know, I'm, I'm eager to, to learn from, you know, to get some sage advice from you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I hope I can be helpful. Yeah. So, um, first of all, uh, are you writing, are you, is it, uh, are you writing scores or, or songs? What, what ah, kind of stuff yeah, are you, absolutely. are you doing? So there's a, uh, a kind of a wide gambit of film and TV music. Primarily what I do is what's called, um, uh, interstitial music. Sure. Um, so sort of like bumpers kind of in and outs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then others, uh, would be called like a replacement tracks. So what that means is, uh, let's say there's a production going on and, you know, you got a young guy in a leather jacket and he's driving a Thunderbird and they want to have, you know, uh, Elvis Presley playing or something. Cause it's like a period piece, mm-hmm. but you know, it's a smaller production and they obviously don't have $300,000 to license the original Elvis Presley track. They'll mm-hmm. come to a guy like me and say, Hey, we need, you know, 28 seconds of a song that sounds like hound dog. Can you make it? And with no vocals. Okay. So yeah, so that's part of it. So sound alike tracks are, are one interstitial stuff is another. Um, and then the other ones are sort of background pieces where a lot of times, at least when I started before people would necessarily come to me with specific wants and needs. Um, you basically just write a track you know, kind of with an intended use in mind, picture yourself sitting and watching, you know, A&E or National Geographic or whatever, and listen to that music that's going on in the background. And that kind of music where you just, you kind of write it and it can be anywhere from two minutes to three minutes to four minutes. And it's stuff that's meant to augment visuals, but not necessarily get in the way. So okay. the, the idea is, is that you give the, the music supervisor and the editor a lot of stuff to work with. So it's a lot of dynamics. And, you know, you might start off with like a simple guitar piece and then you add a shaker and then maybe a little bit of keyboard, like some pad strings, uh, and then you add drums and then you drop it back out to just the strings and guitar. And so you can kind of build a track. So it's a standalone piece of music if you were to listen to it, but it also then lends itself to cut very easily in and out of, uh, any particular scene that's being used. And then of course there are, are the custom track. Uh, options, which I kind of talked about where maybe a company comes to you and says, Hey, we need, we're doing a radio spot. You know, we need a 30 second piece. We'd really love, you know, some kind of grungy biker kind of music, you know, can you, can you do something like a biker band? Okay, cool. And, and then off you go. Um, uh, and then of course there are, there is score composition, which is a, a, a very different, um, thing. I don't do that specifically, I have worked with some smaller, like independent filmmakers, uh, mostly student filmmakers where you compose to, um, screen. So they've already shot the, the scene and then you're composing something to like sort of augment the emotions that the characters are feeling. Um, and that's a very different, um, kind of a different skill set and a different type of thing altogether. But primarily, like I said, I, I make those, those smaller, uh, sort of standalone tracks. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so you kind of touched on this, but uh, um, I guess nowadays you get commissioned a bit, but um, yeah, but but like you you hinted that that you know that's maybe a more recent thing. So before, were you working through music libraries, or how does that work? Yeah, so primarily through music libraries, um, and again, you know, using Taxi, I was able to establish a few really good working relationships with some of the larger um, licensing houses, um, in the U S Canada. And, uh, I think there's one in Australia and, um, and what they do is it's kind of a, they get paid to uh, pitch your music to various productions. So again, kind of like taxi where, you know, a, a, an end user needs something specific. So that user will go to the library and say, Hey, we're looking for this style of track, you know, around this BPM, this type of mood, this type of instrumentation. And they'll go through their giant catalog. Cause it won't be, you know, one or two people. They actually, you know, contract with hundreds of uh, different 
writers, composers, uh, producers, and they'll, they'll shuffle through and they'll find, you know, 30 pieces that they've got, and then they'll send that off to the client. And then the client can kind of choose the one that they like the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is, which is fun because that allows you to kind of get creative with stuff. And if you're, if you're doing, uh, like sync fee placements, um, or even just royalty placements, but like, if you're doing that kind of stuff, it gives you a bit more, uh, creative freedom where you can kind of just be like, well, this is the style of music that I create and I'm going to just make track, 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 track. And then you send it to them, you know, eight out of 10, they, they take the, they'll, they'll, they'll sign. And I'm talking about the library, not necessarily an end user. Um, and then it's up to that library to just kind of go out and pitch it. And then you'll never necessarily know, uh, if it gets used or not until you get your, your performance rights organization statement in the mail or via email now, um, you know, once a quarter or once every six months. Um, and then you get that deposit into your bank account and you're like, Oh, cool. I got a usage. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, you mentioned, uh, two different, uh, payment types, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. sync, sync and, uh, royalties. Yeah. Can you, can you explain, uh, how, how those work and what's the difference? Yeah. So there's going to be, um, and they call them different things, but basically a sync fee would be a, a, an amount of money agreed upon at the beginning of the contract that a company or a production house, whatever, pays you um, on signing of the contract to use your work. Typically, we find these in like buyout packages where you're going to get more if you're doing like commissioned work or stuff that's like very usage specific. So they're like, hey, we want to buy XYZ track from you. And then you get paid. X number of dollars up front for it. And typically then that also will include something in the, in the contract where they're not going to pay you royalties on the back end. Although sometimes they do both. Um, so that's, that's like an upfront fee. And this is the, what's called a sync fee or a mechanical license basically for them to, uh, or to, uh, use your music on uh, a media usage, right? So on TV, on, in a film, over the internet, whatever. Then the, the other thing is royalties or performance royalties. And this is a set fee standardized by, um, in the States, there's BMI and ASCAP Canada. We have SOCAN. Um, I'm not sure what would exist where you are, but I'm sure there's a performance rate society of some sort. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. And they're in charge of, uh, sort of setting rates and collecting fees. So every time that production, uh, airs, you know, um, a percentage of the profits from that show being on ABC, NBC, CBS, whatever gets paid to the writers, the creators, the producers, the music, the musicians, the composers, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's where I don't want to say necessarily the biggest money, but it's kind of like, that's where the best money can be. If you get your, if you get your music licensed on a big show yeah. that ends up in syndication worldwide. Like think about the guys that did the the soundtrack um, or the theme song for friends, for example. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. here we are 30 odd years later and that show is still on TV, 150 yeah. odd countries around the world. Sure. Like, boom. You're done. You're set. You're good. Like that's passive. Yeah. That's real passive income. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of the dream. Does that kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For you? yeah. Okay. That cool. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah. So, um, how, how would you get like, you know, I've, again, for me, I've not done any of this, right. um, ever, I, but you know, um, uh, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about is very similar to the things that I write for theater, you know, the background, yeah. you know, I've just been, uh, I've been creating those background, um, uh, songs or, uh, tracks i guess sure for for the production i'm working on now you know and it's yeah. exactly the same you know it's kind of layered and uh you know you add in one and then you add in another and so that it can all mm-hmm. be uh switched around anyway uh and of course interstitials is something that uh, i do a lot of for for various productions um uh, and even even score you know i've done uh things of that ne- well you know sort of so um but how would i get started you know wh- where do i begin to to get into this um, well, I mean, really it's, it, the, the best, or I should say, I don't even know if it's the best way, but what, what I would say is my way, what happens, right. <laughs> yeah. Is, you know, you end up talking to a friend or, or a colleague or, or somebody that, you know, in the business to kind of ask kind of like we're doing It's like, okay, well, how do you get started? Well, you know, you start, um, local, 
you know, approach radio stations, approach, um, there's gotta be advertising agencies close to where you live. I'm sure, you know, if you just use Google, there's probably two or three, um, you know, you're probably going to be met with a lot of no's at first. Um, but you know, you keep trying and you go to networking events and you meet people and always have a, you know, a business card or a demo CD or, or USB drive, or, you know, now everything's QR codes and, you know, cloud-based, you know, instant access on your phone, which is great because it makes this stuff really, really easy. But, you know, kind of always have that available. Um, Gene Simmons is famous, right? It's uh, famous for saying, um, you know, if you're not going to promote yourself, nobody else will do it for you. Yeah. Right. So, you know, don't be the creepy uncle that always shows up and tries to get their family to like join Amway. But, you know, uh, you do you do want to, you know, promote your music and talk about what it is that you do. So that's always the best way, right? Like word of mouth, feet on the ground, you know, actually being able to like have a one on one conversation with other, with, with another person. <clears throat> the second best way I truly believe is taxi. Um, you know, it, it, it's a great membership site. Um, and it's a great service in so much as they, they, they exist entirely to support their creative musician members. Um, everything that they do, everything that they, and please, you know, anybody listening, I don't, I don't work for them. I'm not a shill. <laughs> I'm not being paid to say this. I just, I truly believe in the organization and what they do. Um, and cr- the other caveat to that is I'm no longer a member cause I don't need it. Um, but you know, their president, Michael Laskow, he, he even says, you know, the, the number one, the best way to get your music out there is, is one-on-one talking to people, making real connections with music supervisors yeah. in real life. The second best mm-hmm. way is taxi because yeah. you know, if you're like me, when I was started, I actually lived in Japan at the time how am I going to meet music supervisors in LA, you know, or even now I'm in Calgary. How am I going to meet music supervisors in LA or Chicago or Toronto or, uh, New York, you know, like it can't happen. Same for me. (laughs) So taxi is, is that middleman that will really get you started and, and going. The third option, which I would encourage you to do too, or, or any of your listeners that are interested in doing this are, and again, you can do a Google search for, um, music licensing or music placement agencies. And you can find a lot of them. Many of them have open submissions. Yeah. The, the caveat to that is if you are using a music licensing house that has open submissions, it means there's very, there's no, there's like no barrier to entry, but anybody and their yeah. brother can get their music put in there. So what you'll find is that those places, it's a bit of a needle, needle in a haystack where they'll have hundreds of thousands of composers, you know, submitting millions of songs. <laughs> Yeah. And it's a huge repository, but there's really not necessarily a ton of quality. Mm -hmm. So the best bet then is to, you know, have your stuff there. If it doesn't get licensed or or placed anywhere else, why not put it out there? There's always a chance. Um, But the, the, the best way, like I said, is to, is to make those connections and then look at those other, the publishing houses that are um, more exclusive, more choosy in who they decide to partner with. Um, and again, you'll, you'll kind of get to that point through, you know, either, you know, connections and networking or through taxi or through, you know, word of mouth. Um, taxi's got a great free, um, forum. Um, and it's like forums.taxi.com. I think it is. Um, you can sign up for free. You can network with other musicians, look for collaborations, um, uh, get feedback on mixes and because it's a very different thing, I think, um, composing and doing stuff specific for film and television, because everything is very niche. Right. Um, and the the kind of music that Nat Geo uses will be very different than the stuff that A and E will use, which is then very different from BBC or CBS or NBC, et cetera, et cetera. And there are different styles and different ways of composing and even different ways of mixing that is really prevalent in those specific, um, genres. And then, um, so you can, you can kind of learn a little bit of the craft and get some feedback before you, you know, kind of going crazy, but collaborations, I I think is another great way that you can, um, expand your, uh, a skill set and B expand your networking. Cause the, the more you do that, hopefully the people that you work with will have some connections. And then what's, what, what might end up happening is that track then gets licensed, with one of those exclusive houses. And then from there you de- you begin developing that relationship with that house personally. And then from there more work comes. And that's basically what happened with me is like, I, I, you know, started getting some placements early through taxi. I had a couple, you know, great relationships with, with like three, 
first one, then two, then three publishing houses. And then basically all of my later work came filtered through those few connections that I had. Um, to this day, even, you know, like 90% of the stuff that I get is because my track is with, or one of my tracks is with one of those houses and somebody that worked with somebody says, Oh, you know, Nick's track is really great. Uh, here's, you know, here's this guy's contact info, um, contact him directly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you, um, you mentioned, uh, those, uh, houses that you, um, you know, that you've, um, kind of gotten in contact with through taxi and through your work. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are, you know, various different kinds of, you know, there are, I know licensing companies that work primarily for commercials and others that work for yeah. TV and others that, you know, work more for, uh, individuals and things. Yeah. There's like um, boutique houses. Yeah. Boutique um, houses. That was a word yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and also like they have different deals. So some of them are, you know, you sign your, the stuff, you know, your music to them exclusively and others you don't, uh, is there a, you know, are, are there guidelines that you need to keep in mind? Let's say I would go out and, uh, you know, again, because, uh, you know, I, I do live on a rock in the middle of the Atlantic ocean. Right. So it, I, my, my, uh, uh, options when it comes, I mean, obviously I can, you know, network in my local area, but if I yeah. wanted to expand to, to, you know, Hollywood or to the UK or Australia or whatever, then, you know, I'd have to do it online. So mm -hmm. if I was going to go out and, and find some, um, some of those licensing companies, are there guidelines that I need to keep in mind to, you know, make sure I'm selecting something because I'm sure. sure that there are bad ones out there and I'm sure that there are great ones out there. So you probably yeah. need to be careful. I mean, the, the, the bad ones or it's, I mean, everything's relative firstly. Right. Um, but the thing that I kind of try to stay away from is, you know, those, those licensing agencies, if they have like a non-exclusive agreement and they're, they're not very choosy, i.e. they like the barrier to entry is, can you connect to the website and create an account? Like they're probably not working very hard to get your like get your music placed. They're using like the shotgun approach, right? Like they're the yeah. fishing, they're the fishing boat with like a giant net off the back that just drags the ocean and grabs every fish they can. Right. Whereas like a boutique house or a very specialty placement agency will be only looking to license music that they know, understand, love, um, or get a sense that they, they hundred percent will be able to place it and get paid to do so. Cause yeah. that's the other thing. These places only get paid if you get paid. Um, so the exclusivity thing is, like I said, the, the, the non-exclusive, I mean, you know, it's up to the individual. Generally, I don't really like it. Um, I like exclusive contracts because that says to me that the agency is going to work hard to make money. The other thing, and I would say it's relatively standard is the royalty split. So what ends up happening? And I know a lot of new, um, new composers or, or new licensors tend to sort of prickle, uh, when I tell them this, but the, the standard rate is a 50, 50 split. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is you own a hundred percent of your copyright because you yeah. should, and you own, um, mechanical production rights, i.e. for like CDs, uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff to reproduce your music. But what you do is you split the, the publishing royalties 50, 50 with the right. licensing agency. And a lot of people go, Whoa, my God, 50, like that's, that's half of my, my income. And, you know, I often, I usually look at it like, well, you know, if you're, if you're brand new and you're unknown, this is your best chance to get your music heard. Yeah. Um, and would you rather have 50% of something or hundred percent of nothing? Exactly. Like yeah. your music's not going to make any money if nobody hears it. These people have the lawyers, the connections, the music supervised, like all of the stuff. They're an entire marketing team that yeah. you pay nothing for unless they make money with your music and then you split. So to me, it, it seems like a perfectly fair business deal. Yeah. Now, once you establish a relationship with one of those houses, you know, you get into, you know, your hundredth or 200th track with them or whatever, you know, enough times gone by, or, you know, maybe what'll happen is usually they will sign your tracks for a period of anywhere between two and let's say 10 years. You know, once the, 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 licensing agreement comes to an end, you can always renegotiate. Yeah. And once that established, that business relationship has been established and you're looking to renegotiate, they may not want to keep you 
right? If they, if they haven't made any money with you, then they probably won't keep your track. But if they have, they're going to want to keep it on board because they know that they'll be, be, they'll be able to continue making money. But at that point you, you could broach the subject like, you know, Hey, I'm really happy working with you guys. You guys, you know, made us, we've made a, a lot of money together. It's been a good business relationship. Um, however, I'm, I'm looking at, or I'm thinking about, you know, maybe changing that royalty split. Could we do a 60, 40 or 75, 25, you know, that kind of thing. And they may, and I'm not, you know, I'm not promising anything, but they may be open to that. Um, once that, is, that business relationship is established, but certainly not right away. Um, so that's, you know, kind of one thing to consider. And then, you know, usage and territory rights, uh, as well. I mean, basically now with the age of the internet, basically everything is, you know, universal or at least worldwide. And, and, and again, that's good. You want something like that because otherwise, you know, you're going to have to go and find somebody specifically in Eurasia and, you know, uh, Europe and then North America and then, you know, South America. Every time you have to go out and find a new house in every jurisdiction, it's like, oh man, what a pain. Um, so, you know, if you can find an agency that's, that's willing to look and place your stuff worldwide, then, then that's good news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I just, uh, really quickly, because, um, you, you know, you talked a lot about taxi and, and, uh, you know, when I was just sort of doing a little bit of research, um, you know, I read some articles and, and, um, and one of the things that I saw was, you know, people sort of warned against, uh, sites like taxi mm. just for the fact that it's, you know, you need to pay yep. to use it. Yep. Uh, but, um, from what it sounds like to me, you know, it seems like a good, although, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it seems like a good way to get, like, get your foot in the door and get some experience going. Yep. And also, um, one of the reasons that I actually have looked at taxi is that, it's a great place to get feedback because yeah. you get you get a written thing right with yes. feedback on your music. Yeah, an actual so, written feedback on your music in terms of your mix, um, yeah. songwriting, build, crescent. Like they'll, they'll give you technical feedback um, yeah. on it as so well. That and to if, me, is is you know you're 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 paying for it's it's an educational thing. Totally. So totally. That was just a, an aside uh, yeah, before I mean, it slipped my mind. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people, again, it's like the 50-50 split thing, you know, uh, when somebody's, and I understand it, right? They're, they're just starting out. They're like, well, I don't really have any money or, you know, I have yeah. a very limited budget or whatever. It's not that expensive. I think it's like 300 bucks a year or something like that. Um, and, you know, I think the part of it that, where it comes from, I think, there's an old adage, right? Like never pay somebody to listen to your music. Yeah. But I think what that is in reference to specifically is like, if you're a band, <coughs> excuse me, with like an album and you're looking to get, um, you know, a management deal or you're looking to make a record deal or you're looking yeah. at that kind of thing, you don't want to pay people to necessarily listen to your music to be like, yeah, it's great. Or no, it's not or whatever. Um, yeah. unless that person that you're paying for the service is asking a reasonable to very low sum of money mm -hmm. and the connections network and education that you're going to get from that person and sort of professional development you're going to get from that person yeah. is actually worthwhile. And in the, in the case of taxi, I think it is. And you, you, you said it perfectly, right? Like you're getting an education, you're getting feedback, you're getting professional, um, structure to, yeah. to learn about the business. Um, and so for me, you know, it, it's kind of a no brainer. It just, it just makes sense, um, to be able to do that. Can you do it without taxi? Absolutely. You know, you can do anything without anybody, you know, the, again, this yeah. is the age of the internet. It's 2022, you know, you could put up a track on, on YouTube and somebody could hear it and get in contact with you and great, cool, awesome. Let's, let's work out a deal. But the yeah. chances of that happening are fairly low because there's so much noise online. Yeah. Yeah. You that's know? the thing. And you know, um, it, you know, a lot of people um, enter songwriting competitions, mm. right? And that's a, another education opportunity because totally. you do get uh, uh, feedback from that. The chances of winning a uh, songwriting competition, no matter how great your songs are, yeah. I mean, it's it's just the odds are low because there are yeah. so many people competing for it. And yeah. if you think about it, uh, submitting a song to Taxi your odds of making money are probably higher, just statistically speaking. Yes. 
um, you know, there are more people making money from that than from winning competitions. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, uh, so, you know, and, and obviously it costs money to enter those competitions and in some sure. cases quite a lot of money. And yeah, so, you know, well, and again, you know, you, you look at the, the listings and the way they write them. Um, it's very specific what the usage, like they won't, they won't give out, you know, company details or right. singers, like the, the artists that you're writing for. Cause they also do singer songwriter submissions for, famous artists, like people that are looking for writers for their new album, for example. Um, yeah. There are a couple um, very big country stars right now who have recorded and have had multi-platinum selling albums based on songs that were written or not based on, but like songs written by taxi, like I, that I personally know. Right. So now again, that's kind of like that songwriting competition, right? It's like, you know, you pays your money and you takes your chance. Um, yeah. You know, the, the likelihood of getting your, your song to, um, a, a singer that's going to have a multi-selling platinum album is relatively low, but I mean, it is anyway, it doesn't yeah. matter where you are. Um, but still the chance is there. And I think that's, that's the difference between something like a songwriting competition and something like submitting to a listing. Um, and again, having industry professionals actually hear it and, and yeah. give you feedback and then pass it on to the other industry professionals that can actually do something with your music. Um, whereas, you know, the music competitions and the songwriting competitions and things, more than anything else, it's usually just an ego boost. You know, not that <laughs> yeah. there's anything wrong with that. Um, no. You know, and again, if you're going into it and part of the competition is you actually do get feedback and you learn how to write better songs and these sorts of things, um, then it makes sense. Um mm -hmm. But yeah, by the most part, you know, th those types of things are usually a waste of money. And honestly, like we've got something here in Canada. I don't know if you, you probably don't in where you are, but, um, there's a company called landmark events and what these motherfuckers do. Sorry. Am I allowed to say that on the radio sure. <laughs> on podcast? Why not? So these, sorry. My apologies. I should have asked first, but what these motherfuckers <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> do is they prey on teenagers. Right. And they say, Hey, we've got this great, um, band open open mic band stage we're gonna yeah. we're coming to your town and we're gonna invite the top 10 bands in your city to come and compete on our stage and the winner is gonna move on to like the semifinals in another city blah 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 and there's prizes to be you know 500 hundred dollar prize and this sort of prize and production and cd product blah 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 mm -hmm. and uh basically you pay to enter and then right. you have to sell a minimum amount of, amount of tickets or you don't qualify to perform on stage. What? So it's pay to play. Oh, so yeah. that kind of thing yeah. is, is wrong and manipulative yeah. and, uh, you know, predatory. And so yes. those are those sorts of things you want to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it, you know, there are no shortages of those types of sites, those types of, uh, people, those types of companies that exist uh, all around the world. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I literally, I'm happy to say that taxi is not one of them. The other cool thing, and I'll stop talking about them in a minute. Cause I feel like I don't, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like this is maybe turned into a commercial for taxi, which I didn't really mean it to be. Um, we need to, we need to go and get, get us uh, some sponsorships. Here. Yeah. Maybe I should, maybe I should send them an email and see if I can, uh, <laughs> start getting commission on memberships or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. But, um, I, at the bare minimum, I feel like, you know, as a member or an ex member, if I'm willing to talk about them this much, that should say something, right? Sure. But the, the other point is, is they actually organize what they call the road rally. Um, and obviously over the past couple of years with COVID, they haven't been able to have it, although they haven't done a virtual, uh, meetup event, but they mm -hmm. actually host a big weekend long, I think it's, uh, four or five days now where they, they, they rent out an entire hotel and a ballroom or several ballrooms and conference rooms. And they bring all the members or every, every member that can come, um, mm -hmm. all converge in that one spot for that weekend. And they invite industry panelists. They invite real A and R um, uh, people. They invite music supervisors. They look uh, for production company heads, marketing heads, all of this. And they all come, and you have a chance to mix and mingle and meet all of these oh, industry yeah. professionals in one place. That for me. Um, and I, I actually did a, one of these kind of like a podcast or like a video interview with a, with another, um, <laughs> with another songwriting friend of mine who actually we met through taxi. Um, <laughs> but you know, he, he was saying the same thing. It was like, that was the best part of my membership was going yeah. there and the industry connections that I made at that live event with mm -hmm. an actual music supervisor was what landed me my first like big time paying job. And he went on to, um, I wouldn't call it a staff writer, but he was like 
contracted to Harpo Productions and wow. did yeah and spent like two years writing music for you know a whole host of shows f- for that giant and for those of your listeners who don't know what Harpo Productions is that's Oprah Winfrey's production company so they did the yeah. Oprah show Dr. Oz Dr. Phil those are sort of the three biggest ones but they also do a whole yeah. bunch of other small Rachel Ray level. man Rachel Ray as well yeah <laughs> right so that's that's the caliber of people that you're getting to meet through that through that thing um, that's that's insane yeah very very cool it's insane um and uh what i mean you you mentioned before that it's it's you know there are niches yes and is it niches or niches it's it's both i think it? it's niche americans uh, tend to say niche yeah there's no t it's, though it, because it's right <laughs> because it rhymes with rich it does uh, yes they they yeah. say there's riches in the niches yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's riches in the niches. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I guess you know any kind of music has potential, but but is 100%. there something? Is there anything that you know is uh, you know this is or I guess that's uh, subject to trends, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. You know what was happening in like 2008, 2009 when I was getting my start was. Um, the trend for music like placements in shows was a lot of like uh trendy up and coming garage bands like sure. bands that were like just about to break so they actually had a little bit of polish mm-hmm. on their sound but they still had that sort of raw young energy and the and a lot of music supervisors and a lot of licensing agencies <clears throat> were looking to license tracks from bands yeah. Um, so, and, and a lot of it was like sort of rock band. So, you know, whatever permutation you want to take of that, right? Like guitar, bass, drums, vocals, um, guitars, keyboards, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of then, and then we saw a little bit of a shift away from that to more, um, sort of like, uh, electronic based stuff and a little bit more, um, I don't want to say digital cause everything's digital now, but like a little bit more like, um, progressive, uh, electronic, like more future type stuff, um, sort of in the early 2010s. And then when Christopher Nolan's Batman came out, which would have been Mm -hmm. 2012, I think maybe 2011, 2012 round then. Yeah. So Hans Zimmer, I think it was Hans Zimmer that did that one. Probably he does everything. Yeah. He does everything. (laughs) Actually interesting (laughs) about him. He actually doesn't most of the music that you hear that has Hans Zimmer name on it. He doesn't write. It's actually his interns. That's yeah, a whole yeah, other yeah. conversation, but, um, that's, that's what most, most producers do as well. It's, you know, yeah. um, you, yeah, you, you work for him either for a very, very minimal salary or no salary, but you get to work with Hans Zimmer and then that goes on your, your resume yeah. and then yeah. you get to get hired and, and placed and, you know, have good careers. Um, right. uh, where was I going with this? Oh, so Christopher Nolan's Batman came out and then interstellar was the other big one. Right. And those two movies sort of shifted the demand for a lot of stuff. And you started getting uh, a lot of like drone type cues. So like, like really low bassy atmospheric moody type stuff. Um, And big bombastic, huge, like wall of sound, like just huge over the top production type stuff. Yeah. And that really changed the scope of what, TV shows and, 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 you know, movies we're really looking for. Um, and then, and again, these are trends that sort of start coming up. So if you want to see what's trendy and, and kind of happening in your particular, uh, niche, you know, find the channels that use music or find the shows that use music close to what you produce and you'll see kind of where it's getting placed. Um, yeah. One of the things that's always, I think, in vogue to use a, an older term, but I, I like <laughs> single, uh, instrument. So like a, a melancholic guitar, you yeah. know, or a happy guitar, like a strum or like a Travis picked, you know, guitar yeah. thing, um, a happy or like a melodic flute, like a single sure. instrument, stuff mm-hmm. like that can be used in myriad ways. And mm-hmm. it will always be on trend, no matter else, what else is going on in the business. Um, but to it's your point, tip. yeah, everything can be, everything can be a niche. Everything can be used. All it takes is the right placement, the right supervisor to hear your stuff and the right scene, mm-hmm. yeah, um, of course. which is going back actually to your asking about how to get started. One of the best things that I think you or any up and coming composer could do, um, you know, or even full-time composer, like if you, if you're already in it and you're just looking to expand, talk to young filmmakers, 
you know, at the mm. college or university or, you know, even like college of art and design or whatever that you've got, if there are people that are, that are studying film, they yeah. need music for their films and boy, would they love to have a professionally written and professionally produced piece of music for their six minute film. Yeah. Um, either something that fits beautifully or even custom composed the first time you do it, you might have to do yeah. it for free or for very of minimal course. or maybe a slice of pizza, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. But those people, when you network and you're able to connect with those people and you do them that amazing favor, yeah, you're providing killer value for their, you know, for their project, for their work, mm -hmm. for their, for their portfolio. They're going to remember you in five years, six years, seven years, oh, eight yeah. years when now they get the big Hollywood contract and they go, yeah, I remember, I remember him. He, he really helped me out. I'm going to give him a call. I wonder if he's still available, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and those, and you don't do it for that, like narcissistic sort of selfish, self-serving way, but that's the, that's the benefit of making those connections early if you can, you know? And, and that's, you know, um, going off on a tangent, but I like tangents. Mm. Uh, you know, we've, we discussed this, uh, a couple of days ago when we, when we first connected that, you know, um, and, and this goes back to what you were saying before as well about, networking and, and yeah. meeting people and all of that stuff um which has tragically been very hard over the last couple of years absolutely but, uh but it's it's so important i think and and uh i i'm always trying to get better at it because i'm like many musicians i'm a bit introverted and totally. not it's not my favorite thing to do to go out and meet new people but i try to do it as much as i can because i think that uh making those connections and you know and helping people out whenever you can it's it's so important and i always you know i'm not i'm not a religious person i'm not a spiritual person per se although i my spirituality is kind of just creativity i think that's kind of um mm. where my th sort of thing falls but i think I, I am a believer in karma in, but in just a, a real world way in that, you know, what goes around comes around totally. And, you know, if you, if you make sure to treat the people around you good and you make sure to help people out whenever you can and, um, you know, give people, you know, just keep giving, be a giver. Yes, I think it, it always comes back always. Um, and it's a small business. Yeah. You know, music in general is a small business, but when you start getting into film and TV, it's very small. Yeah. You know, there are a few players that are making really big money. <laughs> and then there's a few more that are making decent money, like making a good living, you know? Yeah. And then everybody else is kind of floundering. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But like once you make it kind of past that, that barrier where you can actually make some money and you're, you know, you've got some professional contacts and you're doing good work and people are recognizing you for it. It's a mm -hmm. very small world. It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's extremely small. Um, and so, yeah, again, it's just be good, be a good person, be, be, be easy to work with. Yeah. You know, uh, do what you say you're going to do mm -hmm. and do it when you say you're going to do it. Right? Yeah. Um, nothing, nothing will end a contract with a, with a music supervisor faster than you committing to a, you know, a two day let a deadline and then missing it. Yeah you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, absolutely. Or, or not being able to deliver a change. Like once you've delivered your music and they're like, Oh my God, this is perfect. We love it, but we need actually, can you button the end at three? Can you button the ending three seconds earlier? Mm -hmm. Which of course means going back in and re-recording everything. Like it's not just like a cut and paste. <laughs> I can't just edit right. three seconds off a piece of music. No. Um, but you have to be able to deliver that level. And like you have, I've gotten calls like this yeah. where they're like, yeah, we love it. Blah, 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 blah. We need you to change da da da, And we need that in six hours. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm out to dinner with my wife right now, but we're, go I'm going home and I'm getting this done, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. you know that if you miss that opportunity and you can't deliver, that bridge is now burned and they're never, you know, again, there's always, uh, gradations to this, but you know, you of really course. don't get very many chances. Yeah. So yeah, again, yeah. you want to treat people like gold and, 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 uh, you know, nobody likes a diva. No, so be yeah. easy to work with and, and you'll get more work. Um, you yeah. know, and again, to the networking point, you know, be a good hang, you know, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been on the road, uh, as a musician or if you've traveled with your theater, uh, sure. groups or theater companies that you've worked for, but like, you know, who wants to hang out with the, with the guy or the gal that's complaining about how lousy the coffee was and they didn't get enough <laughs> to eat and they didn't get enough, like, I, you yeah. know, it's already stressful enough. I don't want to listen to you bitch and moan. <laughs> yeah. And that person usually won't get invited to the next tour, right? They're yeah, not going to yeah. get hired again. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, and I, that's, this is, you know, I'm uh, like deadlines and, and uh, speed writing and all of that is kind of mm. my, that's my bag. I, I, uh, I'm all about, I, I always say, you know, the, the faster you can write, the more you can write and the more you write, the better you write. So, 100%. Uh, so, you know, I always, you know, they always say, you know, yeah, quality over quantity. Uh, but I say no, because with quantity comes quality. Yes. You know, if you've only written five songs, then if they're all good, <laughs> great. But then you're awesome. some kind of miracle person and that's Or you got weird. lucky. Yeah, or you got lucky, exactly. And then, you know, where are you going to be 10 years down the line when you still only have five songs? Yes. So, you know, yeah, uh, I'm all about that. And and uh, I, I have the feeling that this, like so much of music in today's business is a numbers game, right? You need to have totally. a lot of material. Yes. So, um, and I, I was kind of thinking because I, I, I do love setting goals. Um, uh, and, uh, so let's say that, uh, you know, you wanted to, to have a lot of stuff out there in, mm-hmm. in, in libraries. And I guess you'd probably want to spread them around different kinds of libraries and things like that. You sure. probably don't want to, especially if some of them are exclusive, you don't want all your be- eggs in one basket and things. But how how many like what would you say is a good number to shoot for if you want to if you're going to say okay I'm going to commit to this I'm going to do it seriously and I'm going to you know in a year's time or in two years time or whatever yeah. I'm going to have enough hooks in the water to yeah. have regular income coming in from from those music libraries and things yeah what's a, what's a what's a number to shoot for <laughs> so I think if you want to make uh, like a full time income. Mm -hmm. And so this is based on like North American standards. So like, let's say somewhere between like, and this is broad range, but like somewhere, cause every, again, placements are going to different and you're going to get different rates and different stuff. And you, you never know something might just like hit and go crazy, but like Mm -hmm. somewhere between like, let's call it 80 to $150,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Again, big range, but I think that's, that's a fair number to shoot for. You should look at having anywhere from about 150 to 200 pieces, uh, placed, and working for you at any given time. Okay. So that's not necessarily in libraries. That's actively being used. The, right. Actively so what that good. means in terms of like actual volume for your creative uh, asset portfolio, let's call it that. Yeah. You're probably going to ha- need um, anywhere between 800 to 1,000 pieces. Okay. Right. Um, that you actually have placed and and in yeah. libraries that they are actively uh selling your music for you now sure. again these are rough numbers some some hit that with far fewer and others hit it with way more um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but i feel like that's a pretty good range because again it's all numbers right like you, you said mm-hmm. it perfectly um yeah. and to get back to our conversation earlier where we were talking about niches i feel like the more niche specific you can be and the better that a library knows who you are and knows what type of music you create and how to use your music and what it does. Yeah. The, the higher your chances of getting those placements are. So you, it's funny because as creatives, usually we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves, right? We're like, well, you know, my band is, it's kind of a combination of like, you know, Hendrix, if, if if Hendrix met deep purple, but then they had a baby with uh, Miley Cyrus and then uh, (laughs) they were mixed by, you know, ELO and then, you know, Brian Setzer came in and played guitar for them. That's kind of my thing. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell is that? Nobody (laughs) understands. Right. And I mean, I get it as a, as a creative, you're like, again, we don't want to be pigeonholed, but you have to remember by and large, we're not selling our music to other musicians. Yeah. We're selling to business people. We're selling to visual artists. Yes. So you have to be able to explain your music to them in a visual sense or mm-hmm. in a business dollars and cents sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that they can understand what your music is going to do for them. Uh-huh. So again, the more niche you can get, you know, Nick is the guitar rock, the hard rock guitar guy, right? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, the, the, the rockestra guy, right. <laughs> yeah. Rock music with, with strings in the background, sure. uh, or, you know, Nick is the, whatever, you know, fill in the blank here, whatever that yeah. niche is. And the ner- more narrow you can get, the more laser focused and quickly you'll be able to get those successful placements because people will know what to do with you and know what to do with your music. So sure. I think that's a really big, uh, helpful tip and something that I had to learn, 
um, initially, cause I had been a songwriter, I'd had bands, I'd had several CDs. And again, you know, kind of going through the, the placement agency thing, I was like, cool. And I was submitting my band songs to like, just kind of everything and anything. I was yeah. like, yeah, this would be great. Blah, 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 blah. Cause I was, I loved the music and it was great music. Yeah. But if you pull it apart, it didn't at all fit with what they were asking for. You know, the mm-hmm. one thing it fit was like, yeah, it's got guitars and drums. You know, but it didn't, <laughs> yeah. you know, it didn't fit the, the listing that it, it didn't fit the, the, um, what we call like the memo, you know, the style memo sure. at all yeah. other than that. So, um, again, if you can, if you can get that, you know, really, really dialed in, you're going to find a lot of success much faster. Um, you know, and the other thing too, is that that will then help you in your endeavors on social media, on mm-hmm. YouTube on Facebook, like anything else that you're wanting to, you know, sort of advertise and promote outside of just, you know, placements. Um, it lets people find you better and better. These algorithms are perfectly set up to do it even better than people. Yeah. Right. To get your music. Like if you make a lyric video or you make just even a song that you're putting on YouTube or whatever, um, it's set up perfectly to suggest your content to a user that's going to like it. Yeah. And the more specific exactly. it is, the more people will find you, um, which then, and this goes back to another question that you had earlier in terms of like other things that you can do. I highly, I highly recommend getting stuff on. If you, if you don't have any other placements or any other way to get stuff out there, get your music up on YouTube, get it up on SoundCloud. Um, I hate Spotify. Don't use Spotify. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, places All right, where people Neil. can find, yeah, um, it's got nothing to do with Neil. It's more, <laughs> no, it, it, it's more about how they treat artists and the, the lack sure, of money of that they pay for the people that are, you know, really creating the content that they sell if you think about it. But that's, yeah. again, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but like things like YouTube and whatever, because it gets you out there, it gets you plays, it gets you views, it raises yeah. your cultural or social awareness and credentials if you want. Sure. And you never know who's listening and where, and they may end up contacting it. And this happened to me, uh, last year, two years ago, I had a, you know, um, someone reach out to me and say, Hey, I really like this piece of music. Can I use it in a, in a video that I'm going to be doing? And I'm like, Oh, cool. You know, what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Turned out they were creating a, a marketing campaign for Google. All right. So I'm like, oh, okay, great. You know, cha-ching, right? <laughs> like, yes, yeah. absolutely. Let's make this happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so again, you, you know, sometimes there's a bit of luck in all of this as well. Like, let's not discount of that, course. you know, yeah, with yeah. all things. There was, uh, I remember one time my friend, he was, um, <laughs> this was so, so dodgy, but anyway, uh, my friend, <laughs> he was, uh, he starred in a, in a very, very small film. Okay. Uh, independent film, uh, but his first, you know, he's a comedian and, uh, he was playing sort of a version of himself and it was a really, uh, cool idea and, uh, it was a good film. Uh, but this guy just like bootstrapped it. He just, he just financed it all himself. Right. Uh, he, he wrote it, he directed it, he shot it, he edited it, he did everything. And, um, and, uh, uh so my friend, you know, he was really excited and I was very excited for him. He's uh, one of my best friends. He was my, the best man at my wedding. I was like, awesome. Your first, you know, leading role in a movie. It's fantastic. Um, and his face was like on the side of the cinema. It was very exciting. And very he, cool. he asked me, he, he invited me to the premiere. I was like, of course I'm going. Yes. Um, and then the, uh, it was the day before or the day of, I think the premiere, I got a message on Facebook from the, um, uh, from the director. He was like, Oh, Hey, uh, can I use your song in the movie? <laughs> and I was like, you just put it in there ages ago didn't you and you didn't th- yeah. you weren't gonna ask me but then you found out i was coming tonight <laughs> and i was like of course you can yes thank you yeah. that's very flattering but yeah but i thought that this is this is a very dodgy timing oh that's for you funny to be asking me this yeah <laughs> that's great you know but it was the, good and i was very i was very excited to hear my song yeah. in the movie it was great yeah and that that first time is always so i mean i still remember the very first time i heard a piece of music that i created um, you know, on the radio, I still remember that the first time. And then the, and the first time I wrote something for TV and I saw it in the show on yeah. like TV that I knew millions of other people were seeing, I was like, Holy, like it's a, it's an experience, it's a trip. Yeah. It's really fun. Um, your head gets really big, right? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm famous now. <laughs> and it lasts like, you know, 15 <laughs> yeah. seconds and you go, come on now, nobody cares about music. And then that's the funny <laughs> thing about music too, right? Is it like 
everybody needs it. Everybody wants it. Everybody understands its cultural importance. Yeah. But convincing, and this is to kind of go down the dark rabbit hole of, of modern entity, but, um, nobody wants to pay for it. Yeah. Least of all music production houses or not music production houses, but like movie production houses and TV production. Yeah. It's yeah. always the very last thing they think about. And it's always the, mm-hmm. the least part of the budget, even though it's really the, like picture your most famous movie that you could possibly think of, or the most poignant, you know, TV movie or TV scene or whatever of all time. If you strip the music out of it, it loses yeah, yeah, yeah. like half or more of the feeling, you know, it's yeah. so important. Um, and people don't necessarily really realize that importance until they don't have it. But go back to your thing about you're saying about the movies. Sorry, this is a yeah. Uh, yeah. real quick tangent. I think that's another great thing. And this is again, you know, networking with uh, up and coming film students, up and coming filmmakers, independent film houses like that, whatever else, if you can, if you can create or craft a uh, relationship with an editor, mm-hmm. specifically an editor, not even the filmmaker, but the yeah. editor. Yeah. Yeah. And you can filter him some of your music, some tracks, some songs, sure. whatever, get him. And what will end up happening, him or her, they'll end up using some of that music. If they end up using some of their music in the cutting room as temporary yeah. tracks to cut the film to, oh, yeah, you've just yeah. like 10 X the likelihood that your music is actually going to be in that film because yeah. a, the editor is used to it. B the producer and the director and whatever else will be used to seeing it. And then mm-hmm. when they try to replace said music with something else, it yeah, won't yeah. feel right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And your music will end up getting used in the final cut. That's so, a great tip. Yeah. And again, you don't do it, you know, you don't do it with that like selfish intention, but that's something that can and does happen. Um, yeah. and, and I can tell you for a fact, I've lost out on placements specifically because they've said, you know, they've come back after the fact, Hey Nick, we love the track. We love, you know, everything that you did. Thank you for your time, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we're going to use the temp track that we cut to that we've been using for three months. And it's like, well, duh, yeah. of course you are. Cause like yeah. it, you know, the whole, the whole pulse and beat of the, the, the timing of the thing that you're creating rested on that music. Of course, you're not going to replace it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah. Can't that's, fault them for it. No, that's a great, that's a great, great tip. So just get, I, I have a couple of editor friends. I need to, uh, yeah. Reach out uh, to them. Give I'm going to reach CD. out to them. Yeah. Right. I, uh, I, one of my friends just texted me, Last week, because of um, he was doing a segment on he wor- works for TV and he was, he was doing a segment on uh, Bloody Sunday in mm. Northern Ireland, and so he was like, "What's a great song to put to?" You know, because I'm all I'm so into Irish music, right? So he's like, "What's a great song about the Troubles?" What's a great so you know I I was like, "Well, of course you got to use the town I love so well by the Dubliners." Go on, yeah. And and so he was very happy. So, yeah, <laughs> no, so I need on. to. Uh, he actually knows my music pretty well, so he. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah. He, like, I, could, I could probably slip him a little something. Yeah. So. Um. Anyway, this has been great. Uh, we could probably talk all day. Uh, yeah. About this. Um. And. Um. You know. Uh. Yeah. I've had a ton of fun, and I've learned a lot. So. Uh. Before we say goodbye, tell people uh, where they can find you and uh, and the stuff you do. Totally, um, you can find me all over. If you um, go to YouTube, um, it's youtube.com slash samurai fingers. Samurai fingers. I got the fingers of a samurai when I play guitar. Um, I'm also on Twitter <laughs> as samurai fingers um, and uh, Facebook. I've got um, I've got a free group there, which is educational content for guitar players. So it's Facebook dot com slash groups slash the guitar dojo again keeping with the japanese theme did i mention i lived in japan for about five years anyway <laughs> um and uh I, my website is guitar yeah uh or if you're looking for you know if anybody in your audience is looking for um m- music production service consulting services that sort of thing they can find me morrison media group.com and that's cool. kind of the more you know, stodgy professional looking, you know, website that I refer people to if they've never seen me or never met me like the business folk. Right. Oh yeah. The Morrison media group.com. And then you're like, Oh, okay. And I mean, whatever, yeah. you know, some send me yeah. an email through there and we can get in touch. But, uh, that's basically where, where folks can find me. And, you know, I, I make weekly YouTube content and, uh, teach guitar and have a fun, have fun, basically help people, you know, make music fun again. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, and all of these links will be in the in the show notes, of course. Totally. Uh, so, thank Nick you for Morris, having me. Thanks. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. This was a blast, and um, you know, um, so nice to meet you. So, 
Uh, yeah. See you later. Awesome. Ciao. All right. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And thanks to Nick Morrison for an amazing chat. I know I learned a lot and I plan on taking action uh, on Nick's great tips. You know, I'd love to hear from you and what you got from this. So uh, don't hesitate to go to strongwriting.net and leave a comment or send in a message through the contact form. If you enjoy this podcast, please remember to subscribe and uh, share it with everyone you know. And of course, if you leave uh, a review of the podcast, that really helps a lot. So um, again, uh, thanks so much. And of course, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so by uh, going to uh, strongwriting.net slash PayPal, where you can make uh, a contribution or donation. You can go to strongwriting.net slash Amazon. The next time you feel like Amazon shopping, that will take you straight to Amazon. And um, I'll get a small percentage of your purchases. Uh, It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be helping me to bring you more shows. Or if you want to get a free month's trial of uh, Audible, you can go to strongwriting.net slash Audible, sign up for that, and I get a small kickback from that. But of course, um, the best thing you can do is to just keep listening, keep sharing, keep commenting, and uh, all of that good stuff. So thanks so much, and I will see you on the next episode. All right. Thanks a lot. (laughs) 